test test it is a humbling experience for me to be standing before you today as your main speaker for the hour i have to express my thanks to pastor sakai for sharing this pulpit as a senior pastor although she, he did not ask me directly to be the speaker today and i believe that as a senior pastor he has full responsibility and full authority over the pulpit and i believe that this pulpit is sacred and whenever somebody is asked to speak to be the speaker for the hour it is a sacred responsibility i'd like to express my thanks to Mrs. Violet Palma. Well, I'd, I'd like to really express the confidence and that she had shown when she asked me a couple of months ago to be the speaker. And actually, I have three theories why she asked me today to be your speaker. You know, as you know, I'm not a speaker. I'm not a public speaker. This is not my forte. But I have three theories. Today is a very special day for us women as we celebrate the Women's Ministry Week. Number one, and I think this is one of the qualifying factor. Today is a women's ministry, and I belong to the female gender. I have 46 XX chromosome if you may know so I'm a female so I qualify for that. But number 2 and number 3 this is just my assumption. Number 2 I think she asked me because she thought that if I can solve my parent my patient's problems I should be able to solve my problem. The truth is when she asked me a couple of months ago that and that was in December when we were practicing for the cantata when she asked me it had been my problem as I've told you I'm not a speaker public speaker it had been my problem and up to now I'm still solving that problem but of course with God's help Number 3 my assumption I thought that she asked me because I'm her primary care physician so i will be probably i i i will not i will not decline uh being your primary physician but you know to tell you the truth when she asked me that was a couple of months ago i did not think that it was her who was asking me now i have to make a public confession god has blessed me so much in so many ways and when she asked me i thought it was not ever asking me it must be god and i said i have been so blessed so why should i decline and if god is the one asking i don't know what this, what topic i will say what how i should say it and how i'll sort i solve this problem but i believe god will be the one to give me the topic will be the one to help me to speak and i thank you for the confidence and the trust when you ask me god's description of godly womanhood i'd like to say first about a story about a second grade school teacher who was teaching her second graders about the function of a magnet that's m a g n e t magnet and its function so the following day one of the questions that she asked was my full name is six letters the first letter starts with m i pick up things what am i so when the papers were turned in she was amazed that she found out more than 50% of her students actually 
have answered that question six letters. First letter M. I pick up things. What do you think? More than 50% of the students answered mother. She picks up things. Today is a very special Sabbath as we celebrate one of the God's greatest gift to mankind, and that is womanhood. The topic and the message may be classified as a Mother's Day message, but I want to include all women that include, includes the mother, sisters, the grandmothers, aunties, and all women under the umbrella of what I'm going to say today. What is the basic unit of a community? It's the father, the mother, and the children. But it's sad to know that in this day and time, most of the time, the homes are just with one parent. But the basic, basic unit still is a father, the mother, and the children. The Bible makes it clear that the man is the head of God's creation. He was given the dominion over all other creatures. He was given the responsibility, the privilege, to be able to name all the other creatures, all the species, animals, the birds and the fowls, and even the fishes of the sea. But man, if man is the head, then what must be the woman be? The woman must be the crown. You know, when God created woman, he was finished with his creation. Woman was the last creative act of God. I have to say this in a gist, or I mean, in a jokingly manner, you know, when God created woman, God being the greatest physician, practiced, however, as a general practitioner. He practiced as an anesthesiologist, a cardiothoracic surgeon, a cardiologist, an internist, and even practiced as a recovery nurse. I'm saying this jokingly, but you know, when God created a woman, he has to put Adam to sleep using general anesthesia. And then opened his thoracic cage, took one of the ribs, put it, and created a woman. And then when, when probably, I'm assuming, when Adam woke up, well, of course, he has to manage you know, the electrolytes, make sure that the heart was functioning right. And the rhythm was right, so God was practicing as an internist and a cardiologist. And then recovering, when, when the anesthesia was coming out from his body, he probably had complained of back pain. Why did he complain of back pain? He lost one of his bones. The woman had a backbone. With all sincerity, the backbone of the home and the church is the woman. Without godly woman, their work, their influence, and their abilities, we would have to shut the doors of our church and declare our home unfit place to leave. The message that I will say today is not designed to put women down. It is, instead, it is designed to put them where they belong, in a pedestal. It is designed to show, speak to husbands, to children, and to the family, and to remind them of just how important godly women truly are. I want to take this passage, a passage that was written in praise of godly womanhood, and preach about God's description of godly womanhood. Let's open our Bibles to Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10. And looks, let's look at the characteristics of this godly woman. Her standing, let's read third, verse 10. 
Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. Her price. The word virtuous refers to the strength of an army. For a person, it refers to somebody who is strong, has character, and integrity. Such a woman is far valuable than all the wealth this world can offer. And you'll find in Proverbs 18.22, it says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. If God has placed within your life some good godly women, he has blessed you with more than any material possession this world can offer. Let's go look at her perfection. Read through verse 11. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack or gain. It's her perfection. The godly woman is trustworthy. She always has the best interest of those she loves in her heart. Her husband, her children, co-workers, family members, people in the church. They're blessed by and benefit from her diligence. In Proverbs 19, 14 says, House and riches are the inheritance of the fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. She is exactly what God designed her to be, a helpmeet for her mate. You know, we, all of us, we have the left and the right side of our brain, or left side, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. We are either right-hand dominant or left-hand dominant. And the other, the other they, Stephanie was talking to me some of the questions in her exams, and we were talking about case of like if somebody will have a stroke, uh, which part of the body will be affected. So for, just for information, uh, when somebody will have a stroke that will affect the right side of the brain, that person will have what we call a left side hemiparesis. That means weakness on the other side, the opposite side. And if stroke will be affecting the left side of the body, that person is going to have left side hemiparesis or left side weakness. We are just one side that is going to be dominant and the other. And we are, as women, help to our husband. If his one part of his self is weak, we are the completer. We also can multitask. You know, you probably can relate with me, some of you, that if there's like problems in the family, if there's some, some problems, at night time, your husband will be there snoring and sleeping. They're able to put their problem in one part of the brain. They can compartmentalize, we call it. But we women still awake overnight trying to think what we can do to make it better. It's because we cannot compartmentalize. You know, all the parts of the brain, all the compartments, they will have channels. They will continue to function until we are able to make some resolution to the problem. May be able to relate to that. Man can compartmentalize, we can't. That's why we're emotional. We try to express this in a different way. We can multitask. Let's go to her plan as a godly woman. Verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Her plan. This kind of woman is an asset. She's not a liability to her husband and to her family. Good comes to him that can actually be attributed to her. She supports and encourages him, and she's faithful in helping him all her life. A couple of months ago, I was listening to Helen Diaz, if you know her. Um, I would call her Nanning. I was listening uh, during the time that they were having a service in the Philippines. And when she stood up, because everybody had already said their tributes to the late uh, Pastor Diaz. And when she stood up, she said, I'm not here to 
give tribute to my father. Anyway, when he was alive, all things were said and done, and everybody had already given tribute. I'm here to give a tribute to my mother, while she can still listen to what I'm going to say. Virtuous woman, she did everything in her capacity. One of the things that she said is, when her father was in the studying mode, studying for the sermon, Mrs. Diaz made sure that everybody was quiet and gave, his, and gave the husband a time to perfect and study the sermon. So everybody has to be quiet. There's another thing that she said that, there's so many things, but one of the other things that she said was that when somebody would badmouth the husband or would say something bad, she, was, she would be the one to attack. I mean, virtuous woman, she did everything in her power to support the husband. I know it's hard to be a pastor's wife. And if we're going to compare ourselves to a, a skit or program, we as women are the backstage worker. We direct our husbands, the children, and the others will be in the front and doing their task. We want to make sure that everything is in order and everything is done right. So we had seen her standing. Let's go to her sacrifices. It's found in your verses 13 and 14. Let's read 13. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. 16 and 17. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. Her sacrifices. She gives off her talents. She labors. She shops, not the other shopping. She cooks and still keeps the home. She is a giver of the abilities God had graced her with, and her family benefits from her gracious gift, both to herself and those that she loves. Imagine how would your house be without the ceaseless and selfless labor of a godly woman God has given you. Imagine how our church will be without the delicate hands of the women who want to make sure that the flowers are set before the services starts. Imagine the women who make sure that our potluck are set the tables are set before the potluck. And imagine, too, the women who cooks make sure that food are ready and foods are ready to serve the homeless, that we serve every Sunday. Some of you may probably think these are minor issues. These are minor things. Yes, they are. But I should say that there are vital issues how a church our homes are kept. But and if these minor issues are actually contributory to an organized and orderly environment in our home, in our church, and in our community. Number two, she gives off her time. Verse 15, let's read that. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservant. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She gives off her time. She takes care of the necessary details of the home. I would say, these cuddly women are the tailors. She rises early and she works late. She tends to the needs of her children, her husbands, co-members in the church, co-workers, and all others in the household. She's there when they're hungry, when they're sick, when they're brokenhearted, when there's problems. 
She's there to just listen, a shoulder to lean on. She gives her life to those that she loves. So we have seen this godly woman's standing in the community, her sacrifices, and her service. Let's look at verse 19. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands holds the spindle. 21 and 22. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. 24 and 25. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies sashes for the merchants. She strength, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She labors. Most men and children probably have no idea what a woman does. As I've said in my story, she picks up things. She knows what to do. She cleans everything. She labors. And probably, if the sprinklers in your house are not working, she changed those sprinklers. If the bathroom's not working, she fixes them. She labors. Men, children, need to be sure that you, do, or that you do your part at home, help around in the house. And just for the record, there's no such thing as just woman's work. Let's go to verse 20. She loves. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She loves. The godly woman is moved by her compassion to make a difference in the lives of other people. She has the heart for people that most people sometimes lack. She sees the needs that others often do not see. She reaches out countless ways to help others. Imagine a world without this kind of heart. The kind of compassion would be missing in this world. We thank God for good, godly women. There must be something in her speech. Let's open or read 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Her speech. There's two characteristics of this godly woman's speech. Her speech guides. Her speech is gentle. She guides. She stands by to help those who need who need the benefit of her intuition and her wisdom. She offers counsels to her husband and to her children. Wise are the, individual, and the individuals who listen to the counsels of the godly women God has placed in their hearts. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Proverbs 25, 11. Second characteristic of her speech, she's gentle. She has a way of soothing the hurts of life, whether it is the boo-boo of a small child or the hard blows of life that left her mate brokenhearted and defeated. She has the power to lift others with the gentle medicine of her tender spirit. You know, we as a family, all of us, we're not immune to failures. We're not immune to defeats. We're not immune to problems. But God is so good that he lets us taste the sweet savor of victory and happiness and triumphs. And in any of this case, a woman, she's there for her husband, for her children, in times of failures. But she's there to laugh with them in times of victory. So I've seen her sacrifice, her standing in the community, her sacrifices, her service, and her speech. Next is her self, selflessness. Verse 27. 
She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She watches, selfless. She keeps her eye on those who have been given to her to love. She watches their lives to be sure that they have what they need and that they're walking in the right path. You know, as parents, when our children are growing up, they may, they may brand us as overprotective. When they're growing up, when, some, when they ask if they want to sleep over, we say no to other homes. We want to know who are their friends. We want to know who they go out with. And there's a reason for that. We want to make sure that they are with people, somebody who has a strong Christian experience and will help our children walk in the right path, help them develop, friends who will help them develop a strong relationship with the Lord. We are overprotective, yes, but there is a reason for that. We want to make sure that they're walking in the right path. She works. Whatever needs to be done, woman is willing to do it. Her primary concern is the needs of her family. The needs of the family are met. The book of Proverbs speaks of a contrast between the wise woman and the foolish woman. The Proverbs 31 woman does everything in her power to build up her home, while the foolish woman seems to be doing everything in his power to destroy the things that God has given her. Standing, sacrifices, service, speech, selflessness. That woman must have some satisfaction. Look at verse 28 and 29. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. 29. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. In any loving and properly functioning home, all the members recognize the value of each member. In this case, the children and the husband declare the excellency or the invaluable contribution the godly woman made in their lives. I have to make a point. You know, when, when my children were growing up, my son was growing up, and he's still growing up, he's going to still be my baby. That before, when, when, when they will be asked to give a special number and play the saxophone, I would make suggestions. I would say, play this, stop, play this. And there were a few times that he would walk to his sister's room and ask her what piece he's going to play. And he would value his sister's recommendation. <laughs> there were also times like, on, on Saturday, I would repair his suit, his necktie, and, and everything to make, make it much. And then he would slip and go to his sister's room and ask, is this matching? Is this the one? Is this better? And he would take his sister's, again, recommendation. It made me happy, though. I mean, I, I think I was, I was happy that there is a bonding and a relationship that he values his sister's recommendation and uh, suggestions. And I think that's one of our satisfaction that we'll have, that our children will have a good relationship. Verse 28, what did it say? Her young ones praise her. Those in whom she has invested her life stand up and publicly praise their godly mother and their godly aunties, grandmothers. How long has it been since you have said thanks to your mother, to your sister? your auntie, your grandmother, and the women of our church. 
Only foolish children treat their mothers badly. Only foolish children choose to honor the godly woman who has made such a blessing to their life. 28 and 29. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them. Her yoke fellow praises her. The husband who has received so much from this special woman in his life also praises her for the blessings she had given him. Man, you have a duty to your wives. I mean, to your one wife. Here's the Lord's command. Husbands, love your wives, only wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If God has given you a good, godly wife, you should love her, listen to this, selflessly, unconditionally, and sacrificially. God did not give you wife so that you would have someone to dominate. He did not give you a wife so that you could oppress her and be a little Napoleon in your home. He gave you a woman so that you could demonstrate his love to her like he demonstrated his love to you. Some of you men probably need to ask the Lord to forgive you for the way you have acted towards your wife and your loved ones. Then you need to apologize to your wife, to your loved ones, and ask for forgiveness. If you have been blessed with a good, godly wife, you need to let her know that you love her, appreciate her, and that you are thankful for her. So we have seen her standing, her sacrifices, service, speech, selflessness, and satisfaction. This godly woman must have a secret, right? Let's go to 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Her secret. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. One secret, she has actually three secrets. Number one. She despises compliments. Number two, she deplores conceit. And the last one, she's devoted to Christ. She despises compliment. This woman does not do the things she does for the praise of people. Hers is a labor of love. She's not seeking the passing praise of others. She's seeking the good of those she has been entrusted to care for. Number two, she deplores conceit. She knows that the true beauty is not the artificial adornment of the hair, the face, or the body. She knows that the true beauty lies deeper than that. She knows that the outer beauty will eventually fade. Gray hairs coming, wrinkles, ptosis, drooping eyelids, flabby belly, etc. She knows that the beauty that she had in her youth will eventually change. So she pays more attention to the beauty that is inside. She adorns that person she truly is with love, grace, goodness, and peace. Because she pays more attention to her inner woman than the one on the outside, her true beauty grows greater and deeper, and she becomes increasingly more beautiful in the face of her family and the people around her. Lastly, she's devoted to Christ. 
the true secret of her beauty, her love, and her ability to be a blessing to her loved ones is found in her inner faith. Because she is a woman who loves the Lord, she has the ability to allow the Lord to love through her. She is a blessing to others because she walks with the Lord. The walk of faith is far more powerful than we will ever understand or we will know. Let's go to the concluding, concluding verse. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Ladies, women, mothers, sisters, your children, your family may never know. When there are problems, they may never know how much prayer you may have prayed. They may never know that in the middle of the night, you wake up with bended knees. You have pleaded for your family and for your children. They may never know how much tears you may have shed. And they may never know the pains that you may have felt. God in heaven saw your tears. God in heaven saw your pains, and God in heaven heard your cries. In Revelation 22, 12, Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Mothers, ladies, and all of you, let me encourage you to keep loving, keep giving, keep sacrificing, and keep serving. Your task may appear thankless at times, but one of these days, at the end of the road of life, you will hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Isn't it past time that we rose up and call our mothers, our sisters, the women of this church, and call them blessed? They deserve our praise. After all, they already have the Lord's. Here is something that most of us never think about. This passage may cause many women to have nightmares because they know that they do not measure up to the elevated view of this godly woman. This lofty portrait of excellence sets a high standard that it can be depressing to godly women of today, but not until its purpose is fully understood. First, the woman embodies in all areas of life the full character of wisdom commended throughout this book. This shows that even though the concrete situations in our society up to now is generally envisioned by cast of males dominated by males. The teaching of the entire book is intended for all God's people. Second, as with other character types, this profile is unideal, a particular example of full-scale virtue and wisdom toward which the faithful are willing to be molded. It is not expected, not anybody, not one woman is expected to look exactly like this woman in every aspect and every respect. The fact is this passage is a goal to strive for, not a standard by which to judge our lives, your life, my life. If you see areas in your life that needs improvement, go 
and bended knees. Pray about it. Get work on those areas. Remember this one truth as you hear these words read and preached today. You are human. I am. No one expects perfection from us. We are allowed to make mistakes. You are allowed to make mistakes. I am allowed to make mistakes. But our prayer shall be that God transforms us, clothe us with his righteousness and perfection. Here's the invitation today. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your full fully surrendered as your personal savior, savior, do it soon. Ask God to help you. If there is any, any special lady in your life that you are thankful for, your mother, your sister, your loved ones, or women of the church, you should come and pray for them. Thank God for them. Tell them how much they mean to you. Don't wait for any time. It may never come. There are husbands and wives who need to come before the Lord and ask him to forgive you for the shape you have allowed your, your relationship to be in. Come together and recommit yourselves one to another to working together to make that relationship everything it should be and what God expected you to be. Maybe you need to ask the Lord to help you with your attitude. Pray about it. Ask God to help you. Ladies, mothers, and all of us who are listening today, we have our children, we have our young ones, they look up to us. Everything that we do, they see that. And so that may in every aspect, may we always remember that our thoughts oftentimes become words. May we always watch our words because our words become actions. May we always watch our actions, our actions often time become habits. May we always watch our habits. Oftentimes, our habits become our character. May we oftentimes watch our character. Our character becomes our destiny. Then and only then, through the genuine transformation of our thoughts, our words, our actions, our habits and our character through the genuine transformation through Christ that our character we are secured of our heavenly destiny.